All right, here we are, back in Romans, continuing New Year, still going through Romans, and Romans is the first teaching book in the New Testament, and by that I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are fact books, right? They're facts about Jesus' life. We're following the story of Jesus. We're listening to what he said. We're seeing what he did, and then Acts is the application. It's really another facts book. It's what specifically happened in that first century church, the the prototype model of what we all want to become and be like in that initial, pure, beautiful explosion of the Spirit throughout the church. Facts through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Facts through Acts. Facts through Acts. And then the book of Romans. That was, I I planned that just as a a, um, little piece of flair. I was listening to a pastor. um, His name is Richard Rohr. And if you have any of his books at home, light them on fire. <laughs> use them, yeah, use them to kindle your next fire. I was at a friend's house, true, true story, I was at a friend's house last week, and he, on his desk, he had a Richard Rohr book. He's the kind of friend that doesn't read books, so I knew he hadn't touched it. I just knew it was there, just for the fashion of having a book on his desk. But I said, throw this out immediately. And he said, isn't this like a, a, like a pastor-y guy? I'm like, eh, not really. Richard Rohr said something stupid about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's floating around the world, and so I just wanted to address it real quick as I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. He said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about Jesus, but John is about the Christ, the Christ that is the archetypal um, Christ, Savior of the universe, and that Christ figure uh, supersedes the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about this person named Jesus. The Christ figure is the superseding figure that touches all religion in the world, Buddhism and uh, Islam and all of this kind of stuff. So he's saying that Jesus, as the Son of God, portrays himself in some kind of symbolic form in the book of John, but through the other ones, it's just kind of about a guy who lived. It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. You sound smart when you say something like that. You sound mystical and deep, but it's absolute, you know, I don't want to say the word retarded, but if I were to say that word this morning, I would use it in conjunction with that guy because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the creator of all things. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. The scripture is the word. That's Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. All creation was made through him. He is, the, he is a part of the Godhead. He is God. He came down and took on flesh, and he became our savior. He took sin and death upon himself so we can live in his beauty. Uh, without Jesus, no man can be saved. Is it, is it a tough word? Yes, but Jesus himself said it. Rohr says that Jesus uh, in the book of John is the archetype, the archetypal Christ. And that's just definitionally wrong. Uh, the archetype is, is, is not a type. Jesus is the fulfillment of the person of God in humanity and everything we direct ourselves towards. An archetype comes before a type. An archetype is an approximation of the type. An archetype is a symbol or a shadow of what the type will be. Jesus is not the archetype. He is the type. He is the fullness of the Godhead come to earth that we all direct ourselves. He's the answer. He's the hero. He's the savior. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He will return one day with a sword in his hand upon a white horse and judge all the nations of the earth and they will tremble before him. He's Jesus. He's the ruler of the universe. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and John tell us about him. And then he inaugurates the church and the church lands, let's say the Holy Spirit lands um, upon the church and they explode into action and they begin to take over the world. And for the first 400 years, the, uh, the, the state wants to smash them and does so. And they uh, crucify many early believers, not just the early believers, but really for the first 400 years of the church, the church is hiding out uh, in catacombs. They're being fed to the lions. They start to normalize at the end of that 400 year period. And as many of you know, Constantine accepts Christianity and has uh, a conversion experience. The church grows um, dramatically when it is under pressure. The church grows drastically when it is under pressure. The devil doesn't want you to be in any situations of pressure where you represent your faith at any time because he knows you will grow dramatically. 
The, the devil doesn't want you to share your faith or do anything risky ever because he knows you will grow dramatically. Because persecution equates to growth in the kingdom of heaven. One of the great statements is that it was the blood of the early church, that, the blood of the martyrs that fueled the growth of, of the church, that was the engine of the church. And perhaps you're not seeing growth in your life because you're unwilling to be martyred. And I don't mean simply be beheaded and all that kind of crazy stuff. I just mean put your reputation at risk. Put your pride at risk. Put your, what you put on in front of your friends and family and coworkers, put that at risk. Have, be willing to have that martyred. And that blood, <laughs> the death of those things, being the fuel to life inside of Christ. I deserve some kind of response. And so I bodily responded for all you who are listening to bodily response. But no, don't we all want to die more this year? I mean, don't we all, at our church, don't we all want to die more this year? Don't we all want to just say, Jesus, just get rid of me and have more of you? Because that, that works. When we do that, that works. When it's more of me and you're just kind of like a pin on my lapel, that doesn't work as well. But when it's less of me and actually more of Jesus, and that less of me part hurts. That part is not fun. And it's not just like laughing and rolling on the floor all the time. Maybe some days it is, but mostly it's painful. And then it grows and it's beautiful and there's strength and, and, and beauty and God changes the world like he did with the early church. And that's happening. And I, that's one of the reasons I love being in New York City. It's one of the reasons I love being a minority of a minority of a minority here in New York. Our beliefs, our pursuits, our life, how we chase God, what we do with our lives. I love it. I love it. It's incredible. It's a time where we get to grow because of the challenges that are around us. So that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts, we see that happening. Stephen gets killed. You know, the day after Christmas is um, the holiday that celebrates Stephen. Jesus' birth is the 25th on the, second, on the 26th of St. Stephen's Day because it's about Right after you're born, you die. <laughs> and that's what this is we're doing here. We're doing this baptism that represents the death of our flesh, the death of our old way, dying to our old man, being raised in new life in Christ Jesus. Death is an interesting thing. Um, I was thinking about zombies when I woke up this morning. The boys wanted to walk, watch that. Um, what's that Manhattan zombie movie with Will Smith? What is that? I Am Legend. Classic Manhattan zombie movie. The boys were going to watch it. Bethany and I were going out. They're old enough. Leon turned 14. They're old enough that we can go out and uh, they don't burn anything down, which is awesome. You gotta, when your kids get there, it's such a blessing. And they said, can I watch I Am Legend? And I was like, I don't want, I don't want you to watch I Am Legend when we're not here. Because if we're not here, then zombies will certainly attack you while, we're, while you're watching. I like the idea of zombies. I like the idea of dead creatures walking. Um, I, I, I like the idea that most people live in their death and they're happy with their death and they want to pass their death around. And, and, and their death is con contagious, it's spreadable. And we as Christians, we come to this new life in Christ and come out of the waters and he calls us to follow him and walk with him. And sometimes we like to hold on to our death. But the problem with death is death spreads. And if you have a rotting part of your body that turns gangrenous because of infection, that spreads. It doesn't stay in just one finger. It is unwilling to be stasis or to stay in a stasis state is the right way to say that. It wants to grow. It wants to contaminate things. And I like the new year, and I like the opportunity to put to death the deeds of my flesh and pursue the things of the Spirit. There is something in the heart of the human that when a new year comes around, they want to commit to new things and say, God, I know you've called me to be something. I know you've called me to walk closer to you. I'm making a commitment this year. So the charismatic church gets all wild about the Jewish new year. My buddy Sean Foyt, he was like, we released this album on the Jewish New Year. And I'm like, I released mine on the Portuguese New Year. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something in the heart of man that loves the new year, that loves the new start. 
that loves the opportunity to say, let's hit the reset button. The odometer sets back to zero, 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 and I can start again, and I can pursue you, God, with all of my life and let the dead parts of me fall off. And that's a process. Jesus said in the kingdom of heaven, it starts like a little tiny mustard seed. You plant it in the ground, and it's smaller than all of the other seeds in the garden, and then it grows up and dominates everything. In time, with cultivation, with care, with devotion, it will dominate everything in your life. Yes, God, let it be so in 2023 in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So death is written um, 27 times in the book of Romans. Death is stated more in the book of Romans than any other book in the New Testament because the book of Romans is about the gospel. And the gospel is about going from death to life. The gospel is about the work of the spirit that transpires inside of us when we go from death to life, a distinct reality, a specific change that when I look at an unbeliever and I look at a believer, there is actually something different. It's not just an idea in your head. It's not just a belief because even the devils believe, right? But they don't obey. There's no change. There's no putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And Paul is talking to these groups of people. Right now, he's focusing his canons on the Jews. And he says, because you know the law and because you have circumcision, you think you're special before God, but wrong, you're not. Those forms do not make you special, nor do they make you distinct, even though outwardly you believe you're distinct. Christians are called to be distinct. We're called to be different. And I know it's tough, especially when you're young and you want to fit in so, so badly. So desperately do we want to fit in with the group and not be cast out. One of the things that I, was, I love about my son Leon is he loves people and parties. And we had his birthday party. It was great. We had cookie decorations. Uh, where's Travis? Travis, grandmaster cookie decorator. There he is right there. He made the most incredible cookie. It was the most magnificent cookie I've ever seen before. And Leon chose a, a much lesser designed cookie. And I was sad. And in my heart, Travis won, but it wasn't my birthday. So it was Leon's birthday. So Travis lost. You're welcome, Travis. You're welcome. When Leon was little, he always used to say, Dad, I'm a gamer. And uh, I always I saw such an interesting thing. What do you mean? You, what do you mean you're a gamer? There's something inside of the heart of humans. They want to belong somewhere. They want to be a part of a community, of a group. It's protection. It's familiarity. It's I'm accepted. That cries out in the heart of man. And. The kingdom of God is a place where you're accepted by the, the heavenly father and you're stamped ultimately and you're given a new identity and the world says, that's not a sufficient stamping. Come and be a part of what we're doing. You'll really belong then. And Paul is saying here, you think because you're Jews in your identity that you're somehow different in your heart or your spirit? Absolutely not. I want to read this um, he says this in uh, 17 through 24. I won't read the, th the whole thing. If you call yourself a Jew, uh, you call yourself a Jew and you rely uh, on the law and you boast in God. Now this word Jew, which has been hot right now in the news because of Kanye West, um, comes from Judah. Do you know that? It comes from the tribe of Judah. And Jew is short for Judah. We don't spell it the same way, but that's where that term comes from. The people that lived in Judah were first called Jews. Uh, and so he's using this term in part because it's the term of art then, but it represents the people of God that are chosen by God. Judah, who is called to be a king, and from his lineage comes kingship. And so it represents this governmental state of the people of God. If you rely on the law of God and boast in the law, 
and you know his will and approve of what is superior because you're instructed, and you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for those who are in dark, an instructor for fools, then he just basically goes on and he says, then why don't you do any of this stuff? You're, you, you grew up in church. You know all the Bible verses. You... <laughs> I talked to this one guy who's just a lecherous son of a gun. And he's like, I used to win all of the Bible contests when I was a kid. And I'm like, oh, that's so embarrassing. Don't say that and be a sinner. That's so gross and embarrassing. That's worse for you. You won all the Bible contests and you failed all the rest of the stuff. None of it changed you. God's word, memorizing it, did nothing inside of you. And that's what Paul is saying to the Jews. He's saying, you think because you know God's word, because you've memorized it, you're a teacher to the blind. And yet you yourselves walk in the gutter. You rob temples. You commit adultery in your heart. You walk in the same filth rather than letting the word of God change you and change your insides. He says at the end that it happens by the spirit of God. You just think because you know it, you're okay. Not how it works. This is, there's two parts in this end of chapter two. He says, because the law, you think you're better than everybody else and chosen by God. And because of circumcision, you think you're better than everybody else and chosen by God. But it is the spirit of God that directs you in the way of God. And it's the spirit of God that circumcises your heart. That takes the flesh away. That when you come into the presence of God and The Holy Spirit's poking on your heart and saying that relationship is dangerous for you. And it says, you know, I'm just going to sing louder so the Holy Spirit shuts up, you know. We were at, we, 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 there was the worst house band of all time last night at our New Year's Eve party. And I was thinking they must be really desperate because it's New Year's Eve and all the house bands have been taken because these guys were bad. I think um, the form is the form that the Jews walk in, and they're remember. So we have the Jew, we have the Gentiles, and we have the Jews. We have this community in Romans. Paul's addressing them, and he's going to tell them both: "You guys are both in trouble without Christ. He's the hero. He's the one that changes everything. The gospel can set you free, but the gospel setting you free means also that you change your behavior." And so you Jews, you're coming back into the community and you're like, we're the chosen ones. Yeah, yeah. We're great with all the stuff. I'm going to get arrested if I'm specific, I, <laughs> clearly. Um, and Paul says, no, you're not. The law doesn't, knowing the law doesn't make you special. And yet it's crazy is the law actually teaches us how to live. The Old Testament law, this, we have an antinomian church. It's a cool guy to be antinomian and be like, oh, the law doesn't matter. Just, I just love, I just love the Holy Spirit. I'm just with the Spirit. Uh, and I just want to read you out of the law a little bit and tell me, how, tell me how brutal this is. Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 18 the law. (laughs) Whenever someone says the law is bad, that's stupid. Why doesn't the law justify you? Because you can't keep it. Why isn't the law a justifying agent in the life of the believer? Because you can't keep the law. (laughs) The law reveals sin. The law shows us weakness. It's not the imperfection of the law that's the problem. It's the imperfection of the human that's the problem. The law can never justify you because you can never keep the law. And so when you say, I got the law, I've got the law, 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 law down in my heart. Where? (laughs) It's irrelevant because you're not keeping it. That's what Paul is saying to the Jews of that community. And he says later in in the next chapter, he says, uh, do we nullify the law because we can't keep it? 
because of this incredible thing that faith justifies us. Faith is the justifier, right? The law is not the justifier. It's faith that's the justifier. And that explosion, that answer will come in the next chapter. Do we get rid of the law? He says, absolutely none. He says, rather, we uphold the law. (laughs) We uphold the law through faith. Because the law, rightly discerned and applied, brings life and security and goodness. The law as a taskmaster and a justifier can never be sufficient. Romans 3.31 says that. Okay, and then it says this. Um, and, uh, so we got the law. The law is not going to be sufficient. They say they're keeping it, and they don't. And there's five areas they say they're... Uh, Paul's like, you, you're stealing, you're committing adultery, you're robbing temples, um, and you're basically saying that you keep the law, but you're not. And so those of you who have the law, you're doing these specific things, and it shows that the law is of no effect of justifying you before God. It's impossible. You can't do it. And I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I want to jump into this next part. Um, It says this, as it is written at the end of that law section, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And I find that obviously is absolutely true today uh, in many churches, in many communities of faith, that Christianity is mocked and blasphemed because of Christians that don't follow God's law and his way, right? That they're like, yo, it's totally fine that I can just post my wife in a bikini on my Instagram so other men can lust out of her after her. That's cool, right? It's cool, isn't it? Isn't it a cool thing to do? No, it's not cool. It's wicked, actually. Um, follow the law. <laughs> we are justified in faith, but we also uphold the law of God. I think the other thing that's interesting is in our culture, uh, this application, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Um, you know, we have an obligation as Christians, not just because of us and eternity and how we'll stand before God, but because we represent Christ and his kingdom to the world around us. If you're a Christian in your workplace, people don't look at you and just see you. They see Christianity. People look at you and they see Christ. Their perception of our faith is formed by you. You know, I, li- I hate the um, Aquinas or the Augustine quote that is, you know, basically it's something like, it doesn't matter what you say, it's just your deeds, let your deeds preach the gospel, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. I also preach the gospel. Have deeds, but also preach the gospel. But the deeds thing really is applicable in our standard life in, in God. Uh, in, in the cultural around us, in the world around us, what do we care about? What do we focus on? How do we have grace? How do we walk in truth and mercy? How do we stand up for things uh, like abortion without dropping down to the level of gross hypocrisy, mockery? How do we stand for righteousness and truth in a society without being slanderous, without losing our witness, while still maintaining decorum, while still representing the King of kings and the Lord of lords? God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles, not because of God, but because of you. And so I want to live a life that doesn't add to the blaspheming of God's name. I want to be a pastor that doesn't add to the milieu of trash that spewed about the kingdom of heaven. I would like to be someone that brings honor to the name of God. Amen? And we do that by uh, rightly walking in God's law in his way. Okay, that was the first form. The first form is the law. And the second form is circumcision. The law part is this knowledge base that they have inside of them. And so, again, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much you've memorized. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It matters that you're a doer and not simply a hearer. The second part is this physical mark that the Jews have, and it dates back to Abraham in Genesis 17. It says this, God says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
Verse 12, this is important. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male through your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring. Both he is born in your house and he who is bought with money and brought into your house shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Incredible story about Moses and Zephora. When Moses is on his way to confront Pharaoh and he hasn't, uh, he hasn't followed this ordinance from God and God is furious and is actually about to murder Moses. Would have been a really short story. <laughs> the prince of Egypt would have been half the length. <laughs> because this covenant was really important to God and for us to see the symbol of, symbolism of the covenant is really important as well. And I, I love the most obscure and weird pictures in the Bible. Like, you know, circumcision is... This sounding, especially in kind of our current culture, progressive culture, it's like this barbaric caveman weirdo thing. You throw the foreskin at the feet of the, you know, clay God and he blesses your crops or something like that, right? Like that's how we think about it. We think it's just some archaic, weird, gross thing. But it represents, it represents, the foreskin represents human pleasure, It represents the place where humanity is driven in pursuit of pleasure. It represents excess in the place of pleasure. And humanity mostly gets in trouble pursuing excess in the place of pleasure. And whole societies are destroyed by pursuing excess in places of pleasure. Peter Kreeft says this, he says, Bless, the blessing of God brings abundance. And if that abundance is not an outflow to others around you, and it's just something that brings you pleasure, it, it makes you prideful, God opposes the proud and will curse you and curse your nation. Pleasure is dangerous. When Eve saw the apple, she said what? It looked pleasing to her eye. Pleasure was at the center of the deception of man. And so God said, as a symbol of your being my people, I want you to cut away something that brings extra pleasure. He said, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. It's not just that. It's about the procreation and multiplication of life. It's about that gift being in the bounds of God's way. It's about not being people that are enslaved to pleasure. And so we saw through the children of Israel, every time they would have these nations around them, which Asheroth poles that are shaped like uncircumcised pleasure mechanisms. And they would worship them and they would do all of these deeds and it would cause the people of Israel to sin and they would fall away from God because they were being led by the pursuit of pleasure rather than pleasing their heavenly father. And God has pleasure for us. The scripture, Psalm says, at his right hand is pleasure forevermore. God is not puritanical. God has an abundance of pleasure for us in the right place at the right time. In the most fulfilling possible application. But when pleasure becomes our God... When pleasure becomes the thing that we pursue and that it's more important than the command of God, it all begins to crash and burn. And that happens all the time. That happens in the charismatic movement where the pursuit of charismatic pleasure is superior than to God's word and his way and his order and his law. And then we have it on the super intellectual because there's an intellectual pleasure in pursuit of knowledge. Proverbs says that knowledge puffs up. It makes one feel engorged. It makes you feel empowered. But all pleasure has to be subject to the will and way of God. And the Jews are marked in their physical body with this marking that symbolizes God. I submit my pleasure to you. You tell me how and why and when, and it's going to be awesome. I think the interesting thing for me here is that Christians in our current context have a similar circumcision. And by that I mean they submit their sexuality to God 
and they say, God, I know, you know, marriage is between one man and one woman. We're going to stick with that situation. And therefore, I'm justified before you. And that's not true. I, I, I think one of the primary markings as we move, especially in, a city, in, in our metro areas, as we follow God in the next 10 or 20 years, one of our primary markings will be our perspective on God's view of marriage. That will be one of the main things that, that differentiates us from all of the rest of the people around us. Because if we believe that's sinful, then we're backwards and wicked and Neanderthalic and we should go, you know, live out in the country and chew on each other's necks and whatever. No, that just came to my mind. But that marker, while it's a righteous marker, does not indicate the position of your heart before God. And there are plenty of people that believe in God's form of classical marriage that have wicked and corrupt hearts. And Paul says, it's not your knowledge of the law. It's not the the marker of your sexual body that makes you right before God. It's what's happening inside of your heart and your actions that justify you. And then he'll go on and say that, that no man is justified. Verse 28, Romans 2. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise because it's, this is an incredible picture, because the circumcision happens where no one can see, the praise comes from God, the only one who can see. And that's why the circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. It's the excess places of our life that we say, God, I'm giving these over to you. Will you be the excess places of my heart? Will you be the person that I put first? Will you be my first and only pursuit, my my primary source of pleasure and beauty? Can that be you, God? And then when we seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, then all of these things shall be added unto us. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of pleasure. Bethany and I had lobster last night, and I was just butter and lobster, just butter. Butter's healthy, they say now, and I just drink it. I love it. So glad we've decided that butter is healthy. I've always been an anti-margarine person. I'm like, what is this, plastic? I love pleasure. And God wants us to have pleasure. But if we are people that primarily pursue pleasure, we'll be people that find ourselves primarily in pain. And if we are people that primarily pursue God, we'll be people that primarily find ourselves in peace. It's not that complicated. I know psychology and uh, pseudoscience and all this kind of stuff wants to make it super complicated. You have to have like 10 steps. You have to work out 18 times a day, eat only raw beef liver. But in the kingdom of God, it's not that complicated. God, I want to make you the source of my life. I'm going to pursue you and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness above all things. And then all of the other things he fulfills in his time and his goodness. And they're more fulfilling than anything we could have asked for. Finally, this last point and worship team, you can come up. It says this, no person is a Jew who is inwardly and uh, one inwardly circumcision is of the heart. And then it says this, and it's by the spirit It is the spirit of God that gives life. It is the spirit of God that convicts of sin. It is the spirit of God that has to be at work inside of the life of the believer. This whole thing was about like the written word, the knowledge of the law, the memorizing, great, fantastic. The other part was like the physical body, what what, what you look like, the marking on you. But Paul is saying the essential core of the gospel, the spark where it's alive, is the spirit of God inside of you, circumcising your heart and leading you in God's way. That's the law part. The circumcision part is the taking away of sin. The law part is that, and that's why he says in that first section, that we would be a light to the blind, that we would be a guide to the lost, that we would be people that are led by the Spirit of God, that in 2023, we wouldn't just be like, okay, what are my uh, 10 things I want? I want more money, I want less debt, I want less body fat. Like, no, God, you be my guide. You be my light. You be the Spirit 
you know, you be alive inside of me, the spirit of Christ living and breathing and leading me. That's the, mark, that's the marker of a Christian. The marker of a Christian is not having the law memorized. The marker of a Christ, the Christian is not a specific political perspective, although you better, you, you better have a political perspective that I like or you're out of here. <laughs> it's the life of the spirit inside of your heart. And I want to live this year reliant upon the spirit of God. Not in a weirdo way that rejects the law, not in a weirdo way that rejects obedience and order and all of those kind of things, but in a way where I say, Holy Spirit, I give my heart to you, convict, you, convict me of sin, and lead me into righteousness. This kingdom of heaven seed is like a mustard seed. It's smaller than all of the other seeds in the garden. And then when it grows, it takes over everything. God, this year in 2023, take over more stuff in my life. Shadow more of the portions of my life with your kingdom. Bring more of me under the auspices of your way. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning, for the real genuine artifact that is the spirit of God at work inside the sons and daughters of God. God, I thank you that it's not knowledge that justifies us, that it's not a religious outrigging that justifies us, but it's the spirit of God alive in us. So God, spring to life inside of your sons and daughters. In the, in the places where there's desert, let rivers come and let life grow. God, for everyone getting baptized this morning, Lord, let it be a day where the old man dies and new rivers of life pour through them and life springs up, life and life more abundantly, just like you promised, Jesus. Let it be so. Everybody said amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me, church?